We are now at the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, um, you know, <laughs> we've, been, we've been taking our time going through these uh, letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and uh, there are 22 letters in total. And so the 21st letter here this evening is the Hebrew letter Shin. You guys ready to say it now? Repeat it after me. Here's our, here's our Hebrew. Hold on. Don't get too excited now. That you've gone through 20 letters and now you're an expert. Repeat after me. Shin. There it is there. It's kind of like sin, but shin. So this 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet has five meanings to it. In the word shin here, we have the first shin, which means tooth or teeth. We have the word lo shanisi, which means steadfastness in one's faith. And this is what the word shin is used. It's used in these various aspects. Also, the word shinoi, which means a change for good. And also uh, shura which means to return. And then also Shanach, which means year. Now what's interesting about all of this is the name Issachar in the Bible has this letter used twice in it. One of it is spoken out, the other is silent. And the interesting thing about this letter in that aspect is that remember that Issachar's mom was Leah, his father was Jacob, Jacob, and his brother was Zebulun. And remember, tradition tells us, rabbinical tradition says that Ishikar and Zebulun had a pact. Zebulun would go out and fight, if you will, in the sense of going and getting gain for him and Issachar. Well, Issachar gave himself to the studying of the Torah. And the name Issachar actually has a great meaning to it. As the word is used twice, the name Issachar in and of itself means man of hire. And it also has the idea with it is there is reward. And obviously there was reward. There was reward for Zebulun and there was reward for Issachar. Rabbinical writings in Jewish traditions teach that Zebulun went and labored for Issachar so he could give himself study to Torah. And this name represents, and even the letter itself, Shin, also represents those who support others so that they can study Torah. It's an interesting dynamic as you begin to look at the Hebrew significance of the letter and its meaning in it. But what it really implies is that it shows that there is great treasure and value in the Torah, in the word of God. And I think that's what these next couple of uh, verses here after the letter Shin here, eight verses now. And that's what we've been doing on uh, Sunday nights is we've been taking eight verses, each section after each Hebrew alphabet. And so tonight, these next couple of verses would represent really what the letter in and of, in and of itself does. So the value, the value of God's word, it, it's, it's, it's importance. Now, remember that you might say, well, we've been talking about the value of God's word. Yeah, there's been quite a bit here. But remember that out of these 176 verses in this one psalm, the largest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, 171 of these verses all reference the word of God. Some of them even reference it twice. Only five verses in this chapter do not give reference to the word of God. What I think is interesting about this here is that we see the importance and the emphasis of the word of God. Now, remember, there are various words that are used to describe God's word. It means the word of God, but you'll hear words like statutes or commandments or testimonies or law. And several others, but all these are in reference to the word of God. Now, remember, the psalmist, the writer of this psalm, Psalm 119 we see that throughout the Psalms has expressed to some degree not only his love for God and his love for God's word, but also he expressed his disdain for wickedness and those that persecute him have tried to discourage him and have ridiculed and mocked him because of God's word. Mainly because of his faithfulness and commitment to it. 
So he also expresses that there have been distractions or temptations or adversity or persecutions in his life that have tried in some way to take him away from God's word. But then we see that ultimately he points back to that he was not moved by any of these things. We see at times even a despair in the psalmist in the psalm and he's declaring that he needs God's help. But then we see time and time again the goodness of God faithfully coming through and we see the encouragement of the psalmist. You know that that's what the word of God is for us. That's what it is for us. It's, it's the go-to for life's issues. Are there any issues this evening? Absolutely. Do we have things that are weighing in the balance in our life? Of course. Do we need discernment or wisdom? I think all of us can use some tonight. But we never truly find peace unless we rest in the Prince of Peace. We look to the Word of God, and, and this is where we find the comfort that we need. So, you know, the Christian who is constantly in the word of God is the most joyful Christian, and it's true. Because they're constantly seeking the Lord in his word. And when adversity comes, they always refer back or defer to the word of God. Well, this is what the word says. This is kind of what this psalmist did in this longest chapter in the Bible. And so he now will kind of give a picture that I think is a different dynamic in the first verse. The word is all. The word here for all literally means to fear or to be startled. It means to shake. And it would seem that in this portion of scripture here that... The psalmist had, to a degree, Genesis 49 in view. Because it would seem that he had the picture or the idea, and also Genesis 28, of the story of Jacob. Now, what's interesting here is that we see the word all would mean that he's talking about the fear of the Lord, but in the context of what God's word has done for him. And so he kind of uses it in this context to give us a little bit more of an understanding of how this kind of plays out for his own personal life. So look at what he goes on to say, verse 161. He says this, princes persecute me without a cause. Princes here really are rulers among men. So... It's one thing to be persecuted by perhaps your fellow man, but here he's talking about persecuted by those in authority, those who rule. I think the picture is fitting for us to understand that he goes on to say, princes persecuted me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. In other words, the idea that he's saying here is it didn't matter who persecuted him, fellow man or authority, nothing would take him away from the word of God. Meaning what? That he would practice it. That he would live it out. So much so that it didn't matter who among men, position, title, or prestige, that came against him, he would trust in the word of God. You know, the Bible says the fear of man is a snare. And really it is. You know... The fear of the Lord is something that the scriptures speak about from beginning to end. What does it mean to fear God? It's not the fear of timidity, but it's a fear of reverence of all. This is the same type of idea that he's speaking about in regards to the word of God. Just as one stands in awe of God, he's saying, I stand in awe of your word. In other words, I fear and have reverence too much for your word to even think of acting outside or contrary of it. I mean, literally, why don't you do that? Because the Bible says. That, that's kind of the idea there. I think that's pretty, some would say that's a little bit too extreme. You're taking the Bible stuff too serious. But where in God's word are we directed in any wrong way? 
Nowhere. Every aspect of God's word draws us closer and closer to the Lord. And obedience to God's word, God pays high dividends for that. Sometimes it's hard to obey the word of God. And it's the common problem among believers to be obedient to God's word. I mean, we can agree tonight, and you can say, yes, I agree with you, we're to obey the word, but the question is, do we obey it? It's not a matter of agreeing, it's a matter of doing. And this is why even Peter says, it's better for you to have not known than to have known and not obey. And so we're to do this in all area and aspects of our life. So I can say in my own personal life, I have wrestled at times with not so much flat out disobeying God's word, but not practicing the word of God, which in a sense before the Lord is flat out disobedience to his word. And that's why sometimes we need to ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins. Sins that we've committed knowingly. There are some sins you know you just sinned, right? And then there are some that you don't really know that you did. Maybe you disobeyed the word. And then later on, maybe through a sermon. For me, if anybody knows me and and has driven with me around anywhere long enough, ever since I've found K-Wave on the radio, you know, 17 years ago, I've just been listening to it. And so that's the one station that's in my car at all times. And sometimes... I'll just be driving from point A to point B and a sermon is on and I'll be listening to the sermon. Because at one point, there was, like rarely they would play music. You know, in in, in my early days, K-Wave was uh, the wireless seminary, it was called. I mean, it was constantly teaching. Then I used to dream of the day when I would be on K-Wave. One day this is going to happen. I'll be on here one day. Lord, I know you're going to do it. (laughs) <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> but, but you know, um, you don't need to clap for that. That's all the Lord's doing, not my doing. So it's okay. The uh, Lord took care of it a long time ago. But, you know, you could listen to sermons all the time. Now, you know, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to knock the station I'm on. But, you know, there's all kinds of songs now on there, which is cool. You know, I like more of the old school songs, kind of like the ones that were sung tonight. Them are the ones that just get me, you know. It's like, you know how you do it when you hear your old, you're like, that's my song. You know, like, that's what the older songs do for me. But, but I'll listen to a study and then somewhere in that study, something will jump out at me. And then I'll say, man, that's a good word. And then the Lord will kind of, unfold a scenario earlier in the day and then say, that's what you were supposed to do. Oh, man. God, forgive me. That's what I should have did. So there are times that we just, like I said, knowing and unknowingly, but but this is why the word of the Lord is so important in our lives. Now, remember that there were sins of omission and sins of commission in the Old Testament in the same way we do the same, knowingly and unknowingly. Some we do it because we know that we're sinning and doing it. And, you know, we kind of had this idea, I'll deal with the consequences after. We know that the consequences are never good. But we need God's word. We need it every day in our lives. However you put the word of God in you, you know, because people have all these ways. Well, read the Bible and read through the Bible. And I'm with all that. Trust me, I'm the strongest proponent on reading through the Bible in a year. But whatever you can do to get the word of God in you on a daily basis, do it. Whether it's listening to sermons, uh, whether it's reading, taking that time to have that devotional time with the Lord and reading the word of God. I mean, get it in you because this is what causes us to stand in awe of the word of God. It's what the Bible says. Now, we have to also be careful. Because we can become very religious and legalistic with the word of God. And I think the psalmist is going to touch on this. But what he's doing is he's giving us a good understanding of what it is to have an awe for the word of God. And we we need to have that. 
a reverence for it. Amen? Amen. And, and so I, I'm not saying not to get, you know, some people, you know, they, they barely, they'll, they'll come and perhaps maybe sit down right here and they'll put their Bible on the floor. Don't, don't put it on the floor. Don't put the Bible on the floor. It's not what it's talking about. As some people put their Bible in worse places. I think the worst place is setting it aside when you're at home and every time you come to church, you have to, and then open it up. I think that's the worst place to set the Bible on the shelf where it's never read. The best place to put the Bible is in your heart. Isn't that what Psalm 119 in verses 9 and 10 say? How can a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to your word? Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. What does it mean to be in awe of the word of God? What does it mean? Well, listen to what he says here. He says, listen, princes, governing authority. They persecute me without cause. But my heart stands in awe of your word. You know that this verse is a pretty powerful verse today. We have a chapter, Romans chapter 13. We, this chapter reminds us that, that God has placed all those in governing authority, right? That, that God has placed all those in positions of authority and that we are to obey the laws of the land, right? And, and we are. Christians are. We're to obey the laws of the land. And, and uh, my years as a, as a state parole chaplain, when the parole office was across the street, and I, I worked alongside with the, with the parolees there, and we, we and a, myself and a couple of other chaplains, we, we called ourselves Roman 13 chaplains. And this is what we did. We, we were there not only for the parolees, but we were also there for law enforcement. And, and um, several times I had been on calls where... Um, Something happened, not even to the parolees, the parole agents. Um, it, it was amazing to see how God opened up that door because, you know, the parolees would look at me and because I was in prison and I was on parole and I discharged my number here across the street and would work with these same parolees. It was that open door for me to be able to speak to them and minister to them. But then also because I was the pastor of the church, the 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 parole officers would, would kind of look at me in the same way and say, you know, he's an all right guy. You know, he's helping us. But, but, you know, reality didn't set in until how far the Lord would use that until the day that the supervisor that ran this parole department here was murdered. He was murdered by his wife. He was a Bible study leader at a Calvary chapel not too far from here. And... I'll never forget the day when I received the phone call from the parole department to come out and pray for the parole officers. They, they, they called me here to, to pray with them. And it was, you know, an opportunity to show the love of Christ, but to see how the Lord worked this all out was an amazing thing. And here they are, those in positions of authority, and, and I didn't look at them as parolees, or excuse me, as parole agents, and I was a parolee. I, I looked at them as, these are God's ministering agents, and they need to be ministered to right now. And we are to obey the laws of the land until it becomes contrary to the teaching of God's word. This is kind of the same idea that he's saying in verse 161. Princes persecute me, princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. Think about that. Those in authority persecute me, but my heart doesn't fear their persecution, it fears your word. We see that it's in the book of Acts, right? When they told the apostles not to mention the name of Jesus no more. What did they say? They says, we're going to obey God rather than man. Now, they, they, they would obey the law, but when the law then contradicts what the word of God says, well, this is kind of the same picture here. And so... With this, what do we do? What do we do today when the law requires us to do something contrary to what the word of God teaches? You know, it's so interest, interesting at times when Christians, you know, they, 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 they profess to uphold the law and to hate sin. But without even realizing it, we're, we're actually 
involved in a lot of sinful things without you even knowing it. Through the pain of taxes. Now, I'm not opposed to that. Render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But when you realize what this money is used for, you're going to realize a lot about what you're giving to. You'd be shocked. You'd be surprised. Because when we become political in our views, we are strong proponents against things that, yes, are diabolical and evil, but your taxpayer money is what's funding it. Mind-blowing. And so this is why we need the word of God. This is why we need to pray. We need wisdom. And these days are going to grow darker. And I'm just saying this to try to stay within the context. And so what do we do as these things become more and more darker? We do what the psalmist does. He says, listen, though the princes persecute me, those those in rulers among men persecute me without cause. But my heart stands in awe of your word. So in other words, he loved God's word in good times And in bad times. Do we love God's word in good times and in bad times? Not only just being comforted by it, but running to it. Look at verse 162. He says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. Notice this. In one case, he's saying here that he treasures God's word. He treasures God's word in good times and in bad times. He stands in awe of God's word as Jacob would stand in awe of God there in Bethel in Genesis chapter 28 and verse 17. As a matter of fact, the word for awe, it has the idea of awful. And and the word today, awful, has a different meaning than what it did years before. Because awful actually means awe. And so this is why when you would listen to teachings maybe from the 1700s, 1800s, they say Jacob said that God's presence was awful. Well, today, if you were to say that, you would say, wow. But the word then also meant with great awe that there was fear and trembling in his presence. And this, we could say, perhaps maybe this is where he lent from this. But we see that really the picture here is pretty amazing about his love and reverence for the word of God. So he says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. So the princes that persecuted him perhaps tried to rob him of his joy, but he found greater wealth in the word of God. You know, when we hear bad news, nobody likes bad news. It seems that bad news has a way of weighing heavy on our heart. Does anybody know what I mean by that phrase, weighing heavy on the heart? When your heart just sinks. You know that feeling? I I don't know what that is, but we all experience it. And that's what bad news does. But the thing about the word of God is there's no bad news in it. It's all good news from beginning to end. So when bad news falls upon your hearing, upon your, you know, your hearing of it, right away run to the good news. And as the psalmist says here, when the princes persecute me without cause, I stand in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word. It, nothing takes me away from where I find the precious and enriching word of God in life. That's what it does. It enriches. It becomes that very thing that is of great value. And, you know, I always tell people this, you know, start, just just read the word. You're going through something, just read the word. It's different. You know, you, you get people that, you know, are into studying the Bible for whatever reasons they study it. Some study it for knowledge. Others study it because they want to know the heart of God. And others read it because they're so blessed by the work that God has done in their life. They just can't get enough of the Lord. But God's word has an effect on us the moment we begin to take it in. It changes the way we think. I I like to think differently. And that's what the Bible says. Be not conformed to the things of this world. 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what God's word does. It, and we say this often as a joke when people say, oh, man, you're just brainwashed. Anybody ever been told that before? Well, absolutely. God's word washes my brain. So I have been brainwashed. Your brain needs to be washed, too. You know, so take the word of God. And because, listen, I'll tell you guys, I, I, I'm not one that has lived long. But in my years, I observed a lot of things. And I'll tell you what, there are people who claim to have read a lot of books. The only people that I believe are the people that have been to prison. We read books in prison. I don't think anybody's ever read as much as an inmate does. You have all day to read. All day. You don't work. You read. And you can read. And you can read all kinds of books and all kinds of stuff. And I'll tell you what, I read stuff. I, Louis L'Amour, come on now, man. <laughs> I liked all them Western books, man. Anyways, cowboys and Indian stuff. But a, a lot of just, not only that, books on law, books, you know, I, I never really got into the Bible until I became a Christian. And as I started to read the word of God, I just devoured it. I mean, I read everything that had to do with the Bible. Any book people would give me. For a while, for years, books are what people gave me. And constantly reading and reading. Then you start reading philosophers and thinkers and stuff, words I didn't even understand. So I'd grab a dictionary. What does this mean? Hey, you guys, come on now. I only had, a, I think, an eighth grade education. That was it, as far as I went in school. And you know, don't worry, I got my GED. <laughs> hey, man, my mom was so excited when I got my GED. She's like, I mean, who you graduated college? You know, it's not high school, mom, GED only, you know. But to her, it was like you accomplished something great in life. I remember, boy, I'll tell you, she was so happy. <laughs> I was too. I mean, I think I barely passed. But either way, I passed. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, I started reading all this stuff. And, 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 and you know, when I got into the word of God, it, it, it became that, that, that thing. I got addicted. Is, is that a bad thing? Of course not. Not when it comes to the word of God. So it was like it went from like this old, you know, addiction that it separated me from God to this new addiction that drew me closer to God. Do you guys know that I still read the same way I did 17 years ago? Just not as much because life is busier now. But that desire, because the word of God, as much as I've read the Bible and not just read the Bible. See, people say, oh, I've read the word. You're probably right. That's all you've done. I find it hard when someone has read the Bible more than 10 times and they still don't understand what a passage is. The problem is all you're doing is reading it. You need to study the word of God. It, the word of God needs to become one with you. Paul called it his gospel. Did you know that? He said it. My gospel. Because for Paul, the word of God was his life. This is what the psalmist is saying. And, and, and I'll tell you what, as much as I've studied the Bible, every book of the Bible, and have taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse in this church, over this pulpit, for 10 years of pastoral ministry, I still find stuff in the word of God that it's like, this the whole time. I've, I taught this. There's so much in it. And I always say this, you don't know how rich you are because you don't know the word of God. But the deeper you dig into God's word, the more richer you become. Yes, amen to that. It's so true. And so with this, you know, it's like this, this morning somebody came to me and they says, that, you, that was just so much. I says, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but there's so much in the head, right? It's like in there. It's like, okay, well, what about this, Lord? And what about that? And what about, you know, it's, it's, it's that whole dynamic. Well, this is what he's saying. His entire life is the word of God. Now, remember, the psalmist doesn't have the New Testament. He just has the Torah. And he's writing Psalm 119. All of his experiences are coming from the first five books of the Bible. 
And so his experience with the Lord, to a degree, is experiential, but also the faithfulness and promises of God's word that are carrying him and, his, and sustaining him. And these are the very promises of God's word that he's standing upon. What is he doing? He's looking at stories of how God delivered his people. And those stories encourage him that no matter the persecution he faces, God's word is faithful. Can you imagine now we're beyond the first five books of the Bible, right? You have the whole Bible here, man. You got it all right here. We have a whole lot more to feast on. Can you imagine if the psalmist had the entire Bible and then wrote Psalm 119? What do you think it would look like? Yes, I don't think it would be 176 verses. Maybe we can double that, okay? You do the math. Remember I told you I barely passed a GED. Anyways. <laughs> so, princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice that your word is one who finds great treasure. May God's word be that way for you guys. And don't pray that. Listen, I know people say, oh, pastor, can you pray for me? Why? Because I just want to love for God's word. I, I tell them, I don't want to pray for that. Because either you do or you don't. That's it. You can develop a love for it. Like you develop a love for someone or something. You ever heard people say, oh, I used to hate that. Now they love it. Right? That's like common in our day-to-day -day life. Right? I used to hate him. I used to hate her. Now I love them. I'm married to him. Thanks, God. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Right? So love, you grow, right? You grow. Well, you can grow in love with God's word. And let me tell you something. The more you take it in, the more you fall in love with the Lord. Amen. And the more you have an appreciation for this. And so I just, when I was looking at this, I was kind of reflecting on myself. And, 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 and you know, I, I'm thankful for the Lord's spirit. That when you read the word of God, it's more than just a book. It's a story. And you want to know what? The Holy Spirit has a way of bringing it to life. And it grips your heart, right? You ever do that when you're reading that? Anybody ever do that? Amen. Good. That's good right there. That's when you know, ooh, they're feeling that right. Get them, Lord. Get them. No, just kidding. Anyways. <laughs> but it is a treasure. A precious treasure, but also enriching in life. You know what else the word of God does for us? Not only does it cause us, listen to this, to stand in awe, in fear of his word, in opposition. It also causes us to rejoice in difficult times. When bad news comes, good news enriches our lives but thirdly listen to this you know that reading the bible causes you to hate yeah. oh it does it's funny when i pray sometimes and i say lord i thank you that you're a god of love and i thank you that you're a god of hate people open their eyes did he just say hate yes i did he's a god of hate he hates sin and i'm so thankful that he hates sin and if God hates sin, so should we. And the psalmist says here, I hate and abhor lying. He hates lying. Remember the book of Revelation says all liars will be cast into the lake of fire. You ever met a compulsive liar? Anybody? Only five of us know a compulsive liar? Don't look around. Just raise your hand, please. Okay, good. You ever met someone who tells little white lies? Have you ever told a little white lie? Hey, son, not everybody raised their hand. You just told one right now. A partial truth is a whole lie. A little white liar is a compulsive liar. Oh, well, Pastor Dave, don't, don't say that now. Not right now. Yes, right now. Listen to this, guys. He, he goes on to say here, he says, I hate and I abhor lying. Now, now, you might say, could we ever come to a place where we don't lie? Well, I think we can come to a place where we speak truth. Now, now think with me for a moment without trying to lose track of this. 
Lying is Satan's language. And that's what Jesus said. I didn't say that. Jesus said that in John chapter 8 and verse 44. You are of your father, the devil, who lies. So, you know, if somebody, you want somebody to tell the truth, instead of saying, you know, you know swear or put that on your mama, you know how they do that one? <laughs> that's when you know it's serious. I put it on my mama. You know, then you think they probably don't even like their mom. That's why they're doing that, you know. But anyways... <laughs> I knew a guy that always did that. He put it on his mama. He put it on his mama, left and right, left. I was like, man, bro, you put everything on your mama. You're really, you're serious. He's like, no, I don't know my mom. I was adopted. I don't know who she was. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> I always got a kick out of that one. But listen to this. He says here that he hates and abhors lying. We can speak the truth of God because of God's word. You don't have to be a liar. You can be a speaker of truth. You, you don't have to put it on nothing. Just simply speak the truth. Now, that doesn't mean that there will be a time in which, you know, you won't falter a little bit you know those little white lies those things get you you know it, it, they do anybody ever feel bad after you tell one it's, it's real holy in here right now man some of you are like you know just you're like pharisees man you're like huh lord forgive me that i don't lie as much as them over there lord. <laughs> my goodness man i love sunday nights man these are cool man okay so, but, but, but listen to this, listen to this. I, re I remember one time I told a little white lie and I felt so horrible, but it was a lie. It was a lie, period. I lied. Pastor David lied. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was over something dumb. You guys want to hear the lie? Yeah. yeah, I know you are, Metiche. Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> So I was having a tire going flat on me one day. And I says, you know what? I'm going to go to the gas station and put some air in. So I go pull up to the gas station. It's a gas station that I've gone to before. And I put gas as a car wash to it. Get the truck wash there. I'm not going to tell you which truck, so you won't know how long this has been. Because I've had about three or four since I pastored here. But then I walk in there and I says, hey, can you turn the air on? It's only a dollar. I didn't want to pay the dollar. He says, did you put gas? I said, yes, I put gas here and I went to the car wash. But he didn't ask me, did I put gas today? <laughs> he says, I'll turn it on for you, sir. I said, thank you. You're a good man. And as I started to put air in the tire, you know, I'm there. I'm going for it. And the Lord just spoke to my heart and said, you just lied to this guy. I said, no, I didn't, Lord. He didn't ask. <laughs> Boy, I drove away from there feeling horrible, man. So, you know, when I do something like that, it was only a buck. Somebody asked me for money. I, I, gave, I had like five. I just gave him the money here. I was like, Lord, there's your dollar for the air over there. I gave it to this guy here. <laughs> That's conviction of the word of God, right? It's like the Lord gets you and he corrects you. He doesn't, hey, you know what Spurgeon says? God doesn't let his children sin successfully. That might not be a big thing to you, but it is to me, man. If we allow those little foxes in our lives, those little foxes become boars in the vineyard and they will ruin your walk with the Lord. How do we get away from lying? Read the truth, take in the truth, speak the truth, practice the truth. Truth prevails, but truth also hurts. Truth also hurts you. 
we like to say the truth hurts to somebody when we tell them something that's truthful about them, right? And we say, yeah, that's why you're crying, because the truth hurts. But the truth also hurts you too, because you're exposed. Nobody likes to be exposed, but that's what truth does. So he says here that he hates and abhors lying. Well, God's word causes us to hate sin. I want to have a hate for sin. Don't you? So look at Psalm 119 in verses 29 and 30. Let's just go back a page or two. Look what it says here. I, I like these couple of verses here. And this is what it says. It says, remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. Remember the word judgments means the word of God. The law, judgments, statutes, testimonies, the way. All this means the word of God. So look at what he says here. He says, remove the way of lying. Grant me your law. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. So, so now when you tell someone, are you telling the truth, right? You don't say put this on this or that, right? Tell them John 8, 44. Oh, that'll get them. Is that true? Yes, it is. John 8, 44. Start using that. Yeah. <laughs> Start using that because that's what Jesus said. If you lie, you're of your father. The devil. Remember what 1 John says, there's two types of children. God's children, the devil's children. And so we are to trust the Lord. We are to trust God. We are to faithfully trust in the truth of his word and speak it. And so this is what he's saying here. He says here that he hates and abhors lying. But this is what he does say but I love your law. That's what God's word does for us. As our love grows more and more for his word, and not only because of his word, but because what his word declares, who the Lord is. We, 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 we fall more in love with God. That God is faithful, that, that God is who the scriptures say he is. It's more than just titles given to God. It's that he's God, the creator of heaven and earth. We have a relationship with the almighty God. So look at what he goes on to say here. He says in verse 164, he says, now, now this is what it does. It, it causes us to hate sin, but it also causes us to go above and beyond. Seven times a day, I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Now, Remember that the typical devoted Jewish worshiper prayed three times a day. Psalm 55, verse 17, Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. They prayed three times a day. But here the psalmist says, seven times a day, I praise you. He goes above and beyond what would be required of him. The idea here would be constant and continual. Now listen, the legalist will set a goal, and when he achieves it, he prides himself in it. But the worship of the Lord, one who truly loves the word of God, one who does it because God's word has changed his heart, he doesn't set a goal, and when he achieves it, prides himself in it. What he does is he goes above and beyond because God's word has no limit. It requires us to constantly be seeking the Lord and, and worshiping God. Look at what it says in verse 160. It says, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. That's how he closed out that last series of verses here. The word is truth. So he says here, seven times a day, I praise you. Now notice that it doesn't say, I pray to you, I praise. Now, we know, like prayer... The Bible says prayer brings peace, but so does praise. When you praise the Lord. So you could be a person who, yes, prays, but, but what about the one who praises? Especially how he starts the psalm off being persecuted, praising God in times of persecution. Philippians chapter 4 and verses 4 through 7 talk about prayer bringing peace. Here the psalmist says, praise does the same also. 
above and beyond continually. Because of your righteous judgments, look at this, great peace have those who love your law. Look at that, great peace. The, the calm in the midst of the storm is because of God's word. Great peace, not just a peace, but great peace. And look at what else. And nothing causes them to stumble. Not only do they have great peace, but they have stability in life. So it doesn't matter, guys, listen, what it is that we go through or we face in this life. If we look to the word of God and we trust in his word and we not just read the word of God, but we take God's word in. We often say things, you know, as we're praying, Lord, you know, help me to obey your word. But, but I often say, Lord, let this word be written on my heart. Let it be inscribed in my mind. Listen, there are a lot of people who memorize a lot of verses. You got a lot of them memorized. But just taking in the entirety of God's word, nobody could ever do that in their lifetime. And when we are in the presence of the Lord, there's no need to take it in because the word is going to be there for us. We're, we're not going to be having Bible studies in heaven. The, the, the completion of the word will be there. We'll have a greater knowledge than we have now. But this is why... The word of the Lord, the Bible says, endures forever. It's the only thing of substance, the only thing of foundation, the only thing you and I can build upon, the only thing that we can trust, the only thing that brings great peace and stability in life. I remember years ago counseling a person, and I says, well, all you got to do is just read the word. They says, what's the word going to do? It'll do more than you know. But if you have no desire to read it and you have no desire to take it in because you're distracted by what you're going through, then you know what? It's going to be very difficult for you going through this. When bad news comes your way, get in the good news. It just has a way of bringing peace when nothing else does. It's peace. You know how it brings peace? Um you ever met someone going through something and then you share the word of God with them and they're like, thanks, but I still feel the same. I've, I've had that experience with people, people here in the church, you know, and, 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 and th this is the whole point. I always say this with people, you know, because they, they come and, and nothing against anybody that wants to, but people come and they say, you know, I want to meet with you, pastor. So for me, it's like, okay, what for? And oftentimes they just want to meet with me because they want to tell me what they're going through. And to be honest with you, I'll be straightforward. I have enough that I'm going through. I, I don't really care what you're going through. God knows. He's the one that can fix it. So I really don't have nothing to tell you other than I'll be praying for you. And I will. But read the word. People rely too much on the pastor to fix their problems. I tell people here in the church that, that oversee ministries, listen, you cannot fix people's problems, so don't get involved in their business. Because you might say the wrong thing to them, and they're going to say, well, you said. Always give them the word of God, and trust me, that's how you end a conversation quickly. Did you know that? But when you start with, oh, yeah, what else happened? Oh, what did you do? You know, oh, wow, really? Well, you know what I would have done. No, listen, you keep it on the word of God, and at every front, you keep bringing them to Jesus. They're going to get tired of talking to you. You want to know why? Because you're not giving them ear. You're giving them the word of God. And I'll tell you what. I know at times we're tempted because the story is juicy, man. Sometimes you're more intrigued with their word than the word of God itself. And you want to know what else happened. <gasps> no way. Are you serious? And yeah, that's it. You're feeding into it. He's like, yes, pastor. Yes. Before you know it, you're all caught up in it. And you're going and blabbing it around there. Can you believe that? Well, they just recruited a cheerleader. But when you give them the word of God, there's no way they can get past that. Now, listen, I'm not opposed to biblical guidance. I'm not opposed to counseling. What I'm opposed to is somebody thinking that I have the answer to their problem. I just want to put this out there, guys. I don't. Never have. Never attempted to. 
And when people ask me, well, what is your, Pastor, I just want to know, what would you do in this situation? Well, if I haven't been in that situation, I say, well, I, you know, I don't know. I would pray and seek the Lord. But if maybe I have, I would say, here's what I've done. I'm not going to say it's going to work for you. This is what I've done. Because this is what God showed me. That's as far as I take it. But you know that today, there is more of a push for counsel from experience and man's philosophies rather than the word of God. It's true. So people come to church and they come to receive from the leaders in this church, any church for that matter, pastors. Now, I, I love meeting with people if they need to meet with me and let's, let's pray through this. Let's, let's see what the Lord can do. And, and, but at the end of the day, the details don't really matter to me. They matter to you because you're the one going through it. I'm not the one going through it. <laughs> the details don't matter to me. The details just make the meeting a lot longer. Right? But what matters in a situation like this is the details of God's word. I think if a person would take that same amount of time that they're talking about their problem to talk about God's word, they would find great grace and they would find rejoicing and they would also see that their stability in their life because they've taken great lengths to talk more about God's word than the difficulty or circumstance they're going in. I think all of us in here tonight, if we were to talk about all the things we're going through, boy, we would be here all night, right? But isn't it crazy that whatever you're going through, it's like more greater than somebody else going through. You're like, well, okay, yeah, but, but let, me, let me tell you what I'm going through. It's like you're the, yours is... <laughs> more difficult than everybody else's. You know, it's like I, I listen to things and then the ones that blow me away are the people that are going through some of the greatest trials and yet they're the most joyful and trusting in the promises of God's word. Then the person that's going through electricity bill getting shut off. And I say that's the difference between a person who has nowhere else to turn, like Peter, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. This is like what the psalmist is saying here. I know it's hard to do, but it is doable. Great peace. Have those who love your law. Listen to this. Great peace. Have those who love your law. Do you love the word of God? Don't answer that. Just in your mind, you know, do you love the word of God? When you love something, you talk a lot about it. When you love something, it becomes part of your life. It becomes that which you practice. Nothing causes them to stumble. Stability in life. Look at verse 166. It says, Lord, I hope for your salvation and I do your commandments. That's a pretty powerful verse. It's just as powerful as verse 161, where it says, when princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. He says here, Lord, I hope. You see, hope is, is equivalent to faith. It's trusting in the Lord. Having faith in God. Having a trust in the Lord. Having a hope in the Lord. This is what he's saying here. He's saying, I have hope. I have faith. In God for his salvation. In other words, the Lord is the one who delivers. So at the end of the day, you know what he's saying? No matter how severe the persecution is, God's word teaches me that God delivers. He's mighty to save. I, we love to sing that song, right? Savior, he can move the mountain. Our God is mighty. Remember when that song came out? Everybody was singing it. The problem was nobody was living it. <laughs> the first trial comes your way. You ain't singing that song no more. <laughs> it's like what they say Christians lie the most during praise and worship it's when they lie the most during praise and worship do you really believe what you're singing to the Lord do you practice it well if he is savior and he could move the mountains he's mighty to save you know how powerful that is that means that nothing else should be uttered or said after but, 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 he's mighty to save. You either believe it or you don't. 
this is what he's saying. Nothing else rests on this. You know, when you meet someone like that, don't they kind of irritate you a little bit? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like, you know what, God, give them a, give them a good trial. Let's see how crazy they are now, you know. <laughs> give them one, Lord. Give them, I want to see, you know. But Lord, I hope for your salvation. This, this is amazing. Listen to this. And I do your commandments. So this hope, this faith in God for his salvation. This is amazing. But look at what else he says. And a hope or faith that says, I do. It's not just a hope, a trust and faith in God that he's mighty to save. But it's also a hope and trust and faith that causes him to do. It's what the book of James is all about. You say you have faith. Well, show me your works. Let me see it. Because it's a, it's a faith that works. You could say all day long that you believe in God, but, but, but let's see. Because things are going to test that faith. Remember, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And, and these things happen. And so he's saying here, this is, this is, this is pre-book of James. He's saying here that his trust and hope is in the Lord. And this hope that he has in the Lord also causes him to do. It's a hope that works. Like James says, a hope, a faith, excuse me, that works. It's not that we're saved by our works. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. But our faith works. There's an outworking. So one of the best ways, guys, listen, I, I'm sure that some of us are going to hear bad news, maybe this week, next week, whatever the case might be. Bad news comes pretty much all the time. But I want to, I want to present a challenge to you. You ready for this? The second you get bad news, go immediately to the good news. And take that bad news there and deposit it into the good news and leave it there. Amen? And say, Lord, this is what your word says. So I trust in the promises of your word. I'm not talking about that, you know, don't claim it and, you know, all that crazy stuff people get into. Name it and claim it junk. Don't, don't say nothing negative. No negativity. No negative vibes. No, listen. There's negativity all around us. <laughs> that, that's there. It ain't never going to go away. But you can walk in the fullness of God's word with great hope like the psalmist does here. And then he says here, look at this part, verse 167. My soul keeps your testimonies and I love them exceedingly. In verse 166, it says, he has a hope in the Lord and he does his word. His hope is in the God of his salvation and he does it because he knows that God is faithful to deliver. He lives out this word. And you want to know what he's saying? It's not just an outward expression, but it's also an inward one as well. Because look what he says here. I don't just act like a Christian outwardly. I don't just act like a follower of God outwardly. I don't just practice the word of God outwardly. The reason why I'm able to do it outwardly is because my soul keeps it inwardly. He says, my soul keeps your testimonies and I love them exceedingly. What does it mean? That his love for God's word and his love for the Lord is deeply rooted, but not in a superficial way. It's, it's the reality of his life. And he's saying here that this is an act of the heart. Your heart and my heart can be so intertwined with the word of God. If we really take it in and practice it and trust it, that it is God's very word. And then he says, I keep your precepts and your testimonies for all my ways are before you. Now, listen, there's a lot about the word of God, but look how he closes this out. I love this. He's talking very powerful about the word of God, right? It's like if he's holding it on this pedestal. And we should. We should hold God's word in high regard. He says, I stand in awe of the word of God. But look how he closes it. 
with all of this emphasis on the word of God, look at what he says here, for all my ways are before you. You see what he's doing here? He's bringing it all back to the very reverence that it's not in scripture alone, but it's in God himself. All my ways are before you. What good is it to be a religious Bible thumping Christian? Not good at all. You can be very spiritual without the Holy Spirit. Is that the new word today? I'm not, you know, I'm not a believer. I'm just spiritual. It's a new word today. It's a trend. You could be religious without the Spirit. You could be spiritual without the Holy Spirit. May we never lose sight of that, that in all of this, in all of this reading the Word of God, I'll never forget this, you know. Um, how many of you guys here like to read? Like you just, I know some people don't, and you know, but you know, I, I like to read, and uh, you, you gain a lot from reading. And, and um, you know, I, I we, we have a, you know, pretty good library. We read a lot of books. I remember one day me and this gentleman were talking. He was in seminary and he was writing his dissertation. And, and um, we started talking about books. And before you know it, we got into this. Well, you know, I think this one. No, I think this one. I think this author. This one, this one's good. And we extra biblical material that, that, you know, we read and for things and studying the Bible and Christian living and maturity and so on and so forth. So a lot of these, so we're going back and forth. And then he looks at me and he says, Hey, you know what, man? You, you, you've read a lot of books for not being in seminary. And he says this, and I says, yeah, I have. He says, David, I want to give you one admonition. And I said, what? He says, you could even do this with the Bible. You could read so much that you need to get saved all over again. Be careful how you take it in. Be careful. He says, the Pharisees were very knowledgeable, but they were far from God. The scribes were the interpreters of the law. They were the only ones that could teach you the Bible, but they didn't know God. None of them did. He says, you can have so much knowledge of theology, of doctrine, the original language, various translations of the scripture, but not have a deep fellowship and a relationship with God. That really ministered to me. And so after a while, I just came back to just studying the word of God, not just reading it, but studying it. And that's all I did. And so it, it equipped me in a lot of ways. I always tell people, you know, I, I, I get a kick out of people that, that, you know, when you tell them, hey, you know, I, I want you to teach or I want you to share a devotion. They say things like, oh, uh, you know, well, I got to prepare. What do you got to prepare? You're a student of the word. Or they give that study and they give that devotion and they, they give this, they put this clause out. Well, you know, I didn't have that much time to study. You're not really a student then like you say you are because I'll tell you what, these psalmists had no problem putting a study together very quickly. If you're in the word, the word of God is in you and you always have something to say about the word of God. When you feel you need to prepare for a group of people, that's because your desire is to please the people, not God. But when you open up that word and you say, this is what God spoke to my heart today, and you allow the spirit of God to lead you, friend of mine, let me tell you, you will go places in teaching God's word. There's no doubt about that. I say all that to say this. I'm not the greatest Bible teacher. I say that before the Lord. I know great Bible teachers. I don't know the whole word of God. But I do love this word. And I do live it out as best as I possibly can. And I don't like to use notes at all whatsoever. I just teach from the Bible. Every sermon, I've been doing that for 10 years as the pastor here in this church. These notes that you see on the screen are people back there who gave their time to come tonight for every service and type as I'm talking in real time. Those are their notes. They're putting them up there for you. It's a blessing to be able to be led by the Spirit and trust the Lord. Oh, you better believe sometimes... When I go and speak somewhere, they always ask me, what's the title for your sermon? I don't have one. Because when I do prepare, when I get over there, the Lord's like, you're not teaching that. And it's like, well, what, what am I going to, God, what am I going to do? Let me see my notes here, you know. It's, God, what am I going to do, you know? 
And the Lord says, I want you to talk on this topic. Well, there's never a problem. Once the Lord gives me a topic, and you want to know sometimes how he does it? I'll walk into the church, and everybody's telling me, hi, oh, Pastor David's here, you know, this, this, and that. And then somebody catches me before the service starts, and they start telling me what they're going through. And I'm listening there, and I'm talking to them. And I was like, oh, really? You're going through that? Yeah, yeah, wow. All right. Well, let me pray with you real quick before the service starts. I pray with them, and I walk away, and the Lord says, that's what I want you to teach on. Are you, are you serious? They're going to sit in here. They're going to think I'm talking about I don't care. That's what I want you to teach on. Okay. You know that I went to a church and I prepared. Boy, I had this nice, ser polished sermon, man. It was a new chapter in the Bible that I, that I haven't really taught through. And it's like I, God gave me a word. Right? I get to the church on a Saturday night. You had a Saturday night service. And then three on Sunday morning. Same sermon, one sermon. Those are the easy gigs, okay? All of a sudden, I'm like, this is good. Man, I can't wait to get back home. I'm going to teach this that living way. You know, this is going to be good, right? Look at this. I get there. The Lord speaks to my heart and says, I want you to teach on this. I'm like, well, what about the? I get it, Lord. You want me to save it for tomorrow, huh? Okay. So I teach on something different that Saturday night. Come Sunday morning, I get to the church and I'm like, I got the sermon ready. I even got up early, restudied it, kind of just added some more things. Like, this is why, man, it gets better and better, right? Check this out. I get there, the Lord's like, I don't want you to teach on that. Now I want, I taught four different sermons from four different books of the Bible. And then the pastor was like, bro. It's not the same sermon. We could put you four times up on our, you taught all, yes. I don't know what happened. The Lord did it. Tell him something, not me. Okay, so anyways. <laughs> and you know that that one polished sermon, I've never taught it. Boy, that's a bummer, huh? <laughs> Listen, enjoy God's word. Obey God's word. Live God's word, love God's word, hope in God's word, trust God's word, because in it, we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. Right here.